Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. We're talking about the gifts of the Spirit. We're continuing on with Pastor Ryan's series on the Holy Spirit. And uh, last week I talked about and opened the door for the gifts of the Spirit. And uh, so today we're going to be talking about the second half of this, which is the, the last six gifts. We talked about three of them. We'll give a little recap in a minute. But we've got to decide of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Um, it's not on your screen, but I just want to read part of what we were talking about last week. 1 First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4 to 11. It says, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. It's kind of amazing to me. He gives us gifts and service and working the same God for different purposes. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. In other words, it is for the edification of the church. So we're talking about spiritual gifts being the edification of the church. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. God is in control. He wants to be with us. And that's what we were talking about. I want to wrap up a little bit of what we were talking about last week. The first thing is that God always has and will always desire to be with his people. He wants to be with us. He desires to be with us. He wants to strengthen us and unify us. And he does it through the Holy Spirit. And it is at a beautiful time where we can talk about the Holy Spirit, right around the Christmas season when we come in, where Jesus came on the scene and he lived his life, a sinless life, and he died on the cross for us. But the one thing he gave to us was his spirit to be with us, to teach us all the things he has taught us. Did you know that the scripture even says, you know, you're going to be able to do the same things and even greater things than I have done. Why? Because the Spirit is in you. Because God is going to work through you. And he's going to work through the edification, for the edification of the church. We talked about spiritual gifts are God's grace and favor in order to edify the church. The word gifts that is used in this particular context is not something that you can just show under a tree, but it is a gift of favor, a gift of grace when he speaks to us or moves on our behalf. We talked about the distinguishing between the fruit of the Spirit and every one of us is working through the fruit of the Spirit because it edifies the believer. If you look at the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians, you're going to see that. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, all the nine. Every one of them. But it's designed that we are all supposed to be developing the fruit of the Spirit, but the gifts build up the church. And so it kind of behooves us to continue to grow in Him so that we can be used in the gifts of the Spirit. Gifts should not be confused with spirituality we talked about. It is not given so that we can be stars. That we, oh, I'm a healer, come on over here and, and get healed. Because the next point, it's proprietary. See? God's gifts are proprietary. 
You didn't even know what I, you thought I was speaking in tongues last week. I practiced that all week long. Amen? So what that simply means, it is God's alone. It comes from him. They are not my gifts to be used with them whenever I want to. It is God that distributes them for the common good. Every single one in this room can be used of any of the gifts, but they're not yours. But if you open your heart and you allow yourself to be used of God, it, you don't even know what you could do in the Lord. And you'd imagine how we can be together as a church and be unified. We also talked about the fact that the gifts work anywhere at any time. It doesn't have to be within the four walls of the church, but they can be in a small group. It can be at home with your kids. It can be in your marriage. It can be at work. You can work the gifts of the Spirit for edification. And so we talked about the first three. The first one being the gift of wisdom, which is simply a greater revelation about God and His Word. Now, we all study God's Word, don't we? How many of you study God's Word? And you, and you do it just to perfect yourself. And there is wisdom that comes from that. And what we're talking about here in the gift of wisdom is something even deeper and greater that happens when God shows up to give us a supernatural Word. And I love when that works. Because in my job, I see it all the time. It's amazing. I said this last week, but it's amazing sometimes when I'm talking to somebody and I'll say something that is above and beyond anything I've ever understood. And I didn't study it, although I put the scripture inside of me, but God uses it in such a way that I'll look at them and say, did you hear what I just said? And one of the most embarrassing questions there, I don't know, you probably have, have said the same thing. When you're talking to somebody and you say something really profound and they say, what did you say? And you're like, ah, I don't know. <laughs> because I know it was a word of wisdom. The word of knowledge is similar. It is greater knowledge about people, circumstances, or biblical truth. This is not book learning. It is the ability that God would tell you something about a situation, about a person that needs help. Then there's the gift of faith. And this is supernatural faith for the extraordinary and the miraculous because God wants to give us the extraordinary and the miraculous. If we're going to settle for God, we're going to settle for the best. We're not going to settle for what we want because he is able to give immeasurably more than what we could ever ask or imagine. If you limit your knowledge and your understanding of God on a fleshly level, you're missing out on the almighty God that wants to speak to us and wants to do miraculous things in us. Amen? But supernatural faith, as we talked about it, it, it especially works in trials. <laughs> How many of you go through an awful lot of trial and you need that gift of faith? It's not just a faith that says, I believe in Jesus. It is a faith to say, I believe in Jesus even when I don't see it. He is the way maker. He is the one that makes it happen. Even when I don't see it and even when I don't feel it, he is working. It is the faith that says that God is there even when I don't sense him. He is there even when I don't see him. He is there when I don't feel what I'm going through right now is so devastating. God's an awesome God. Amen. So let's take a look at the next. You know, we, were, we had a chart that we were filling in here um, and just wanted to show that. The first three, wisdom, knowledge, and faith. And now we're going to talk about the gifts of healing. Now, as we looked at this chart last week, we recognized the fact that every gift comes from who? comes from God, and it is for the church. And this can be, again, it can be distributed in any time God wants to use it. And I'm going to tell you something. He wants to use it every day. You never know what you're going to be used in. Grow closer to him so that you can use, and sort of like our Paul said, desire the greater gifts, the eagerly desire the greater gifts. So this is the gifts of healing. This is given to the church to restore physical health by supernatural means. Now, this is, the, this is the interesting thing about this. It's called the gifts of healing, not just gift of healing. 
And the plural indicates the healing of various illnesses and suggests that every act of healing is a special gift of God. He wants to touch us. And although the gifts of healing are not given to every member of the body in a special way, like the gift of healing, all may pray for the sick. And we see that in James chapter 5 when it says this in verses 14 to 16. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Why? Because the prayer of a righteous man or a woman is powerful and effective. Your prayers can be powerful and effective in ministry to the body, in ministry to another person. Every one of us, you just don't even know when healing can happen. I was just talking to somebody out, out in the foyer after the last service, and, and he was sharing how he had a stroke. And yet God is doing miraculous things for this body, and the doctors are able to see that, and he wants to be able to give his testimony. You know, we see that a lot of times, you know, people come down to the altar. You may not see this, but God works in your heart, and he works in your body, and he works in your soul, and he heals us, and he touches us. George Wood said, different ways healing is administered is through the laying on of hands, through speaking an authoritative word, or through anointing with oil. There are a variety of gifts and varieties of healings, physical, emotional, spiritual. There are gradual healings, and there are instant healings. Folks, God still touches us. Maybe you're praying for healing, and you just don't see it. And usually I'll say to somebody the one three-letter word, it's yet. Well, I prayed. Why are you giving up? You know, Jesus taught in, in Luke 17, he said, he, he taught a parable that the, for the disciples to pray and not give up. It was the parable of the persistent widow who kept knocking on the door. I need something. I need something. And the judge finally says, all right, you have it. Because God wants us to petition him. But do not judge what happens. If, if something hasn't happened right away, God has still touched you. And we are subject to the will of God too, right? Because he is able to give immeasurably more than what we could ever ask or imagine. Don't limit yourself, folks. Don't limit. Allow God to touch you. Look at what Jesus did in his healing. It's amazing to me. I did a little survey. And you know how, how many ways in which Jesus healed? He touched the leprosy, the person with leprosy, and he was healed. He healed the centurion's servant of palsy by just speaking. He healed Peter's mother-in-law of a fever by touching her hand. He drove out demons from two men into a herd of swine. He healed woman, a woman with an issue of blood just because she touched the hem of his garment. What faith. He healed two blind men by touching their eyes. He healed a blind man in Bethesda by spitting in his eyes. <laughs> oh, boy, we need sanitary stuff here. You know, Jesus, just, he just did his work. How about this one? He healed a, man, a man's blindness by spinning on the ground and put mud in his eyes and told him to wash in the pool of Siloam. <laughs> Jesus healed in every imaginable way. Do you, he can do it in every imaginable way here. And even in an unimaginable way, because you can't even know how God wants to touch you. But don't put God in a box. Let him touch you. Let him heal you. Amen? All right, let's move on to the next one. Oh, by the way, he healed the invalid of 38 years at the pool of Bethesda. And when he, before he did that, he says, do you want to get well? It's almost like God knew that 38 years of crippleness caused hopelessness and helplessness. And he said to him, look, I'm going to heal you, but can you live the life I want you to live as a new person? And that's the God that does everything whole, body, soul, and spirit. 
Matthew 15 says, There were great crowds that came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and laid them at his feet, and he healed them. The people were amazed, the Bible says. But here is the end result. And they praised the God of Israel. They praise the God of Israel because he's here with us to be with us. Now, folks, I'm going to tell you something. It takes a little bit of faith here because maybe there are some people that don't get healed. But God's will is being done. God's will is being done. No matter what happens, God's will is being done. Do not give up praying. And do not give up seeking God's healing. He may do it in a way you can't even imagine. We've already talked about that in Scripture. All right, let's go to miraculous powers. The gift of miracles. Sort of similar, isn't it? Than healing. These are deeds of supernatural power that alter the normal course of nature. They include divine acts in which God's kingdom is manifested against Satan and evil spirits. You see, miracles are distinguished from healings in that miracles include a demonstration of God's power in an unusual measure. And they especially relate to miracles in the realm of nature. How about this one? Do you remember Jesus? He was... He had a bunch of people, about 5,000 men. And so you got to imagine that there's probably a lot more people than just 5,000 people. And he looked at his disciples and he saw that they were hungry. And he says, I want someone to go to Wawa. And they contacted Instacart and DoorDash and nothing was there. In other words, they didn't have anything but a few little scraps. But guess what God did? He turned that into food, and he multiplied it, and multiplied it, and multiplied it. And that was the greatest miracle. He didn't even have to teach. Just imagine what God does. He meets needs through miraculous powers, and he's still doing it today. I don't know how many times when I was doing the Thanksgiving feast, we were looking at, I don't know how we're going to feed this many people with this food. And we're always amazed at how many times God comes through. I'm always amazed when I look at the bank account, our bank account, my personal bank account. How many have ever looked at your bank account and wondered how you were going to do it? And somehow it gets done. Because we're tithers, right? Because we're given to the Lord. There is something about putting yourself in God's way so he can, he can work through you. It's miraculous powers. A miracle may provide someone in need as well, Elijah and the widow, who had just a little oil left. <clears throat> How about Elijah? You know, he was uh, combating. Here, here's the most lopsided battle ever. When he was challenging the prophets of Baal, and he had them build an altar, and he built an altar to God. And then he had, he waited, you know, he waited an ample amount of time trying to get the Baal God to destroy their altar. And he couldn't do it. He mocked them. He joked at them. Oh, maybe he's asleep. But then he, you know, he would, they were done with that. But then guess what? God came. After Elijah put bucket upon bucket of water on the altar, God's mighty power came down and he took the entire contents of that altar. He was there to demonstrate that there is no God like God. There is no God like the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There is no God that can do the miraculous like him. Don't look at your circumstances. We always look at it and we have a yeah, but syndrome. Yeah, I hear you, but. God hasn't done it for me. Yet, it is always amazing to me, and I said this already, but it is always amazing to me when people talk about, I prayed about it. And he hasn't answered me. Yeah, I I prayed. That's it. You prayed and gave up. 
seek the God that loves and cares for us and might just have something better than you could ever imagine. Keep pushing in. Don't give up. Don't give the enemy the glory. Because one of the things that miraculous powers does is it kicks the enemy out of our lives. The greatest miracle is the miracle of Jesus, where we did not deserve to be saved, but Jesus died on the cross so his blood could cover our sin and that we could be in heaven with him for all of eternity. A miraculous power with him being raised from the dead. <laughs> That's God's power. And you know you have the resurrection power within you, according to Scripture. Don't stop short. Don't focus. You know, my favorite Scripture is in Proverbs 3, 5, right? Trust in the Lord with half your heart. All right. Just wanted to see. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean somewhat on your own understanding. Well, lean at least partially on my own understanding. No. Don't lean on your understanding. The faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have to have that. You build it and you understand that God can heal, that he can use miraculous powers, and that he can remove the enemy from your life, and he can heal a depression and an anxiety and anything that torments you because the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Miracles. It can happen. Sometimes you don't have to have them. Huge. It's just a miracle. It's just a little thing, but it's there. God's move. It's a move. Next, the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy. This is a special gift that enables a believer to bring a word or revelation directly from God under the impulse of the Holy Spirit. One of the things I'm just so fascinated about is that God has a voice and he speaks to us and he doesn't want us to go astray. And so sometimes he'll speak a word of prophecy to bring us back around. This is a proclaiming of God's will and exhorting and encouraging God's people to righteousness, faithfulness, and endurance. The message may expose the condition of a person's heart or offer strengthening encouragement, comfort, warning, or judgment. George Wood says that the prophecy involves two things. One, forthtelling, which is declaring the word of God now. God can declare his word now. And then foretelling, which tells of the future. And Jesus did that tremendously, especially in Matthew 24 and in and, and other areas of Scripture where he proclaimed what the future was going to be. You know, when I, how many of you ever read the Bible through Genesis to Revelation? Some of you haven't, huh? Okay. Listen, it confused me when I got to like Habakkuk and Ezekiel and Malachi and what are these people? Isaiah. It just didn't seem to fit. And then I did something really great for me because it helped me to understand where the prophets were. I read a chronological Bible. How many have ever read a chronological Bible? It is, it is a gift of understanding. It was the one, one time when I read the Old Testament in chronological order, how I understood all of the prophets and what they were doing and at what time they were doing it and who was in power at the time and what was going on with the Israelites at the time. God was trying to speak to his people. Israel was going astray and God was trying to bring them around through the prophets. And isn't it neat that God can still use prophecy today? If he sees the church going in the wrong direction, if he needs to encourage us or strengthen us, that he can speak a word through somebody. It is God himself with his word. In 1 Corinthians 14, the prof, it says that prophecy speaks to the individual to strengthen, encourage, and comfort. But how many of you know that prophecy is for the unbeliever too? Look at this scripture in 1 Corinthians 14. It says, but if an unbeliever or someone who does not understand comes in while there is prophesying, 
He will be convinced by all that he is a sinner and will be judged by all, and the secrets of his heart will be laid bare. So he will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. I was raised Catholic, and I was saved in a Methodist church. I came to Pentecost, charismatic assemblies of God. And I'm like, what is this stuff? This weird knowledge, you know, it's like it's prophesying and tongues and all of this other stuff. And I, and I used to be afraid. I used to be afraid to have people come into our building and hear, hear a word like that in tongues or in prophecy. But not anymore, because I read this scripture. It is for everyone. God can speak to every single one of us. He can bring somebody to their knees. He can bring somebody to a saving knowledge by speaking a word of prophecy in the church. That's what it says. Don't be ashamed, folks. It's really frustrating. I said this at 9 o'clock, and I'm going to risk saying it today. Is it okay? All right. It's kind of a little disturbing when I hear there's a philosophy out there that the gifts aren't for today. The gifts aren't for today. That somehow the tongues, it's some from the devil. I got to tell you something. Why is it that we want to believe something that muzzles the very mouth of God in our lives today? We have to know, when I studied these gifts, it was, it was sort of like, it's like God revealing to me, this is the way I speak to my people. And God is active in, us in this day. Yeah, it may not sound like, you know, rational at times, but you know, you can feel it. You can feel it. God is working. So speaking of that, the next gift goes along with that too, which is the distinguishing between spirits. That seems kind of weird, distinguishing between spirits. But how many of you know you can be deceived? There are so many things going on out there that you can be deceived. And it is important to have the spirit of distinguishing the spirits in your life. And you know when somebody's preaching the word and all of a sudden something doesn't sound right. Somebody's given a prophecy or there's an interpretation or a tongue and something doesn't sound right. And you discern in your spirit. You know that the enemy can come in and try to confuse you. Folks, there's one thing that television, social media, radio has done is it's created confusion in the church. Because we're listening to so many preachers and so many different philosophies. It's almost like we're going from place to place to place until we get something that tickles our fancy and somebody that can encourage our hearts but never talk about sin. And we need to be able to distinguish. I think that's why God placed us in a church. I'm not criticizing because I, I, I think the, the media waves are great for evangelism, but they shouldn't be your food. It shouldn't be your food. This is your food. When Pastor Ryan gets the word of God from his, God's heart himself, that is the food that we rely on. Don't suck on someone else's juices. That didn't sound right, but okay. Folks, there's so much out there, and yet he gave the gift of discernment. The gift of discernment. It is a special spirit-given ability to discern and judge prophecies and to distinguish whether or not an utterance is from the Holy Spirit. This combats false teachers and distortions of biblical Christianity. It allows someone to determine whether or not a person brings a special message from God and whether or not a person or message are sent from God. God. The reality is that Satan wants to counterfeit God. He is there ever trying to do that. He will take one little part of doctrine and he will blow it up and we will follow it, but we won't look at the whole counsel of God. 
And it gets distorted and twisted. And God wants to protect us, to keep us on the straight and narrow. And so sometimes he will come on with a prophetic word that says you have to keep following me. Keep your eyes on me. Help you keep your nose in the word and you know what the word is. You know how he can tell a counterfeit? Know the real thing. Don't study the counterfeits. Know so much the real currency that you can spot in an instant what is counterfeit. And this is the distinguishing of spirits, that we know God so much and we know the spirit so much that when something else comes, it just doesn't sound right. But God moves in our hearts. Paul warned the pastors in Ephesus to distinguish between those who came as wolves in sheep's clothing and those who bear a true message of God. I love this story in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, it is the story of Simon the sorcerer. In verse 9, it says, Now for some time a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. Did you, did you know that, that sorcery can actually amaze people? That we can be led astray, and we're not good determiners of what is true and what is false. He boasted that he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is rightly called the great power of God. If you don't discern and you just look at whatever it is you're seeing, you can be deceived. Use discernment, folks. Fill yourself with the truth of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. I don't want to be known for that. But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. There's something about the power of God that's greater than sorcery. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. And when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. And when they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come to them, to any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also the ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Sorry, it's proprietary. It's God's. It's not yours. Peter answered, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Folks, we have to have the ability to discern what is right and what is wrong. Because sometimes the gap between the two is very thin. Know the word so you can discern correctly. Grow closer to the Lord so you can discern what he wants you to know. Amen? Are you with me? The last two kind of go together. Tongues and interpretation of tongues. Very interesting topic here, tongues. It may be an existing spoken language or a language unknown on this earth. I have heard stories where, you know, there was a, uh, a tongue given in, in a uh, congregation, and it was actually in German. The, the people didn't know it, but there was one person that needed to hear it, and he was German. God can speak in any language that he wants. This is not learned or often unintelligible both to the speaker and to the hearer. Why? Because it comes from the very Spirit of God. It involves the human spirit and the Spirit of God intermingling so that God gives expression or utterance at the level of one's spirit rather than the mind. See, that's why it just doesn't make sense. And when you hear something, someone give a tongue, 
you can just imagine God is communicating with us. Unless, of course, we discern that he's not. Because one of the things that is listed in Scripture is that every tongue should have what? An interpretation. Because he's, God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. And he wants us to know what he is really saying. See, in congregations, this must be accompanied by a spirit-given interpretation that communicates the content and meaning of the utterance to the community of believers. Now, this may contain revelation, knowledge, prophecy, or teaching for the assembly. Now, let me just say one thing. When you were baptized in the Holy Spirit, any of you that knows you were baptized in the Holy Spirit, you were given a language. It is the initial utterance of the Holy Spirit baptism, speaking in tongues. But what that is, is not the tongue that is, is evident within the church as a corporate whole. What you have, if you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, as Pastor Ryan was preaching, is your prayer language. It's what you, you know. God can speak through you. He can pray through you with words. And here it is in Romans 8, in verse 26 and 27. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance to God's will. And so there's a difference between the prayer language that you have when you're praying for somebody and you don't know what to pray for and you allow the Spirit to pray through you and tongues within the context of the church. God is speaking to us in both cases, but we're not going to understand it. And don't even try to it. Don't try. And you can't coax this. Everybody, Pastor Ryan is saying, you know, you just have to just praise God. Don't seek after the tongues. You just praise God, and God will fill you with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I've seen people, you know, hey, just say, uh, bought a Honda. I should have bought a Honda. <laughs> I actually heard that one time. Just say, bought a Honda. I should have bought a Honda. And just say it fast. It's, it's, it's a gift that is given to you by God for individual use in your own prayer life. But when we talk about tongues, it is an almighty God that wants to crash our intellect and wants to crash where we are right now to speak to his church, to edify us, to lift us up, to warn us. Now, the problem with the Corinthian church is that they... They, they kind of had this wrong. That's why Paul had to teach them. And I mean, there were people in tongues all over the place, and it was out of order, and, and things just weren't working the way that it was supposed to work. So he came up with 1 Corinthians 14 when he was trying to instruct them. And basically it says that when we have tongues, it is done, done in control with prayer for interpretation, no more than two or three in a service, an appropriate time in an inappropriate way. Let me tell you something. If worship is going on, and in the middle of worship you hear a tongue, probably not God. Because I know that God is going to do it in an orderly way. And so you'll see most of the times when a tongue is given, everything is kind of calmed down a little bit. In fact, that's one of the most exciting uh, spots for pastors. It's when things kind of calm down because it's like, is God going to give a word today? And then guess what? As soon as that starts to happen, guess what we're doing? We're discerning and praying according to Scripture for interpretation because God doesn't want to confuse his people. In 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 14, there's several Scriptures here. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries of the Spirit. Verse 13, for this reason, the one who speaks in a tongue should pray that they may interpret what they may say. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit pray, prays, but my mind is unfruitful. <laughs> Don't let your mind get involved in it. Don't overthink it. This is where the Holy Spirit just uses you, and it comes out. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I also sing with my understanding. 
Verse 27, if anyone speaks in a tongue, two or at the most three should speak, one at a time, and someone must interpret. But if there is no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and to God. And then finally, verse 39, therefore, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. But everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. God is with us. And he wants to speak to us. The final gift goes with tongues, obviously. It's the interpretation of tongues. And it's a very simple thing. Because all it is is a spirit-given ability to understand and communicate the meaning of an utterance spoken in tongues. That's what it is. That's not an interpretation. (laughs) That was a sneeze. It functions as a directive to worship and prayer or as prophecy. It is a means of edification as the whole congregation responds to the utterance. Now, it may be given to the one who speaks in tongues or to someone else. So in other words, when we pray for interpretation, you can see the same person doing the tongues and the interpretation. I've seen Angela do that on numerous occasions. Or we will hear a tongue where God is speaking to us. It's interpreted by somebody else. But in all ways, God is communicating with us. Amen? Just imagine that. So when I look at all nine of the, of the fruit of the Spirit, uh, the gifts of the Spirit, this is simply amazing what God does. Let me just put it together for you as we close. When I look at all nine of these put together, and this is, this is really great, you know? It's like when Ryan said, hey, can you do this? What? And I didn't know a lot about it. You know, we, we know cursory, so I had to do a lot of study. But what it did is it made God come alive. If you study this, I dare you to allow God to come alive in your heart when you're doing it. Because here's what he taught me, that God wants to be wise with his wisdom. He wants us to help others with, its, with his knowledge. He wants us to increase our faith for the impossible and the miraculous. He wants us to be healed and whole before him. He wants us to miraculously strong against evil to do the impossible when it comes to spiritual warfare. He wants us to be able to hear from him about our future or to strengthen us in the present. He wants us to be able to distinguish between him and a counterfeit. And he wants us to hear directly from him verbally within the context of the church because he wants to lift us up and he wants to perfect us and transform us and unify us because we're going to need it more and more in the last days. So you're going to hear God doing more things in the gifts of the Spirit because he wants to bring us around to being strong strong in him. Amen? This is just a cursory, kind of a, a small summary of these, but I'm going to tell you something. When you read it as a whole, the picture that I get is that God cares about his church. God cares about us being together in the darkness of this world. Folks, perfect yourselves. Get the fruit of the Spirit. Grow in the Lord. You don't even know you'll be used in any of these gifts. You can be wherever you are. At any given time, God can use you. But it is the edification and the transformation of this church body in this world that he is after. I just, do you feel it, folks? God is on our side. He's a loving God. He's an awesome God. He's a good God. He is a faithful God. He wants to be with us, and he will be with us through the gifts of the Spirit. That's how he dwells in us. Praise the Lord. So let's pray. Let's close in prayer. And let's just allow the Lord to perfect this in us today. Lord, we're just amazed. Some of this can sound academic as we, as we try to, you know, drill down on the specifics of some of these gifts. But the one thing that we can take home with us is that you care about your body, the church, so much 
that you speak to us. Lord, we all have cell phones. We all communicate to one another. But you have a direct line to your people. And sometimes you just want to put us on speaker. You want your word to be on speaker. To edify the entire church. And so when we look at the gifts of the Spirit, whether it be a healing, whether it be miracles, whether it be faith and knowledge and the discernment of spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues or prophecy, it is you communicating to your church. I'm just so grateful for that. Encourage your people with that, Lord, that even when they're outside of this building and outside of the church, you help them to grow by the fruit of the Spirit, but you can use any one of us to edify through the gifts of the Spirit. The bottom line is you're an awesome God and you care for your people and you want to be with us and you will never leave us or forsake us. So thank you for your word. We give you honor and praise today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.